This is Whitley Strieber, and this is Dreamland. You've reached the edge of the world. Well, today I am honored to have a UFO investigator of long standing stature in this community. Dan Wright is with us. He joined MUFON in 1978. He was MUFON staff, uh, uh, on the MUFON staff as project manager for the abduction transcription report in 1992 and served in that capacity until 2003. Now, we're going to be talking today, though, about the CIA UFO papers. In autumn of 2016, the CIA sent to its website a cache of electronic files previously released under the Freedom of Information Act, but housed at the National Archives. Among a variety of subjects were unidentified flying objects. Dan, welcome to Dreamland, and this is your first visit. So, everyone, welcome Dan. He'll be back, I'm sure. I'm very excited to have you on Dreamland. Thank you. Good to be with you. Great. Okay, can you tell us what first brought you to this subject? <clears throat> I have to go back to my father. Uh, he was an ordinary, overnight, 18-wheel uh, truck driver, and he hauled bread up and down the coast, the Michigan coast. Uh, Lake Michigan coastline. On a given night in 1967, as he had done several hundred times before, uh, driven on US 131 along the lake side, you know, lake shore, he spotted something as he was traveling south that was to his left or to the east. And it was a curiosity because it was a perfect fear, but it was pulsating from very bright yellow, orange, or amber, down, dimming down to the point where there was simply a, a little light ring around the outside. But then over several seconds again, it would come back to great brightness, only to dim again. He, at first, because he knew every yard light, every tractor path along this route, at first, he wondered, what the heck is this, and how far away is it that I seem to be even with it? Um, it's got to be a long ways away to have that kind of apparent size. But over the course of miles, he realized, no, it wasn't that large. It was more like 25 or 30 feet across, and it was about a quarter mile from him pacing his truck. Finally, after about 15 miles, he decided to stop the truck. Uh, another motorist who had been kind of chasing this thing, he was on his way to work, he stopped behind my dad's truck, and they stood outside and watched it as it continued to do this monotonous dimming and glowing. My dad said, I happen to know that there's a tractor path. Uh, into the field just about 50 yards up here. I couldn't get my truck up there, but I've got a gun in the truck. He, he carried money, so he was authorized. Um, and we can get in your car and take that tractor path and get real close to this thing. Well, the other guy said, you know, I think I'm about as close as I want to be right now. And he just <laughs> barely had those words out of his mouth when it, in an instant, shot forward from a quarter mile away to less than 100 yards away. And that was it for this guy. He threw gravel with his car getting out of there. Well, my dad stayed for another few minutes, and even though he had fought in World War II and was a pretty brave guy, he wasn't sure he wanted to walk into that field by himself. So he finally started the truck back up and drove over a long hill and it stayed in that spot. He looked back in his rearview mirror, and it was just hovering slightly above the ground. So that's what got me interested. I was in college at the time, and, and I thought this was an, a very odd thing. I'd never even considered the notion of UFOs until then. It was interesting, but not compelling to me at that point. So we skip forward then from 67 
seventy-seven to nineteen seventy-eight. Um, I was by then I had joined MUFON and I was in the midst of covering about fifteen different cases in and around Lansing. Well, I was traveling with a work companion from Lansing to Kalamazoo, which is more like in southwestern Michigan. And we were traveling along I-94, a major interstate that connects Detroit and Chicago, when I saw paralleling the eastbound lanes as we were going west, there was something that could not be an airplane. It had two red lights, one seemingly on every, either wingtip. And so I told my companion to stop the car she was driving, and she did. And this thing apparently, I'll always believe, reacted to our stopping. It made a tight left turn and came directly over our car, just a couple 300 feet above it. It was what many people have called a boomerang. Others have said it's a triangle. And I understand why both terms are used, because it's almost a complete isosceles triangle, but the rear edge kind of bends in a little bit. It had a red light on either wingtip, which would, of course, violate FAA rules. Well, by the time it went over us, it was only doing maybe 20 miles an hour, silent. It was simply charcoal black. I didn't see a door or a window or an insignia, not so much as a rivet on it. And it went over our car, continually descending until it made virtually a ballerina's pirouette over a farm field right next to us, and almost a complete 360, and then at jogging speed, moved over a little clump of trees in the, in the field and simply stopped there and hovered above those trees. Well, as it was in the process of doing this, my companion said, run, Dan, run after it. Well, I was a runner at that time, and I thought, great idea. So as I'm kind of looking up at it, I started running, forgetting that every interstate has a metal fence. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. I, I bounded off that like a trampoline and landed on my butt. And the first thing I could think of was a Star Trek line. Um, take us up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. There must have um, been somebody in that, that thing having a good laugh. <laughs> but in in the course of that uh, levity, I got kind of a queasy feeling. No, I'm not supposed to run after them. I'm just supposed to stand here and watch it. Well, eventually, I, after oh, several minutes, I saw a car's brake lights come on on a dirt road that was maybe a quarter mile distant. Um, And I thought, that's somebody else who's looking at this thing. I've got to go talk to them. I ran down the, it was a newly harvested field of corn. I ran down a corn row and found them. And yes, it was a young father and his um, son. And they were looking at it. So as, as I'm in the process of telling them, the beginning of this encounter, it very gradually, still just 50 feet off the ground, very gradually started up first at walking and a jogging speed, 20, 30, and and eventually accelerated while staying very low to the ground until it was out of sight. Well, if there was anything I needed to keep me in this business, that event was it. Now, 19 days after that, that occurred on a Sunday night in early September, and on a few Friday nights after that in late September, I was at home in a small town west of Lansing, and I had already hooked myself up with state police, county sheriffs, city police, airports to send me these people. You know, if anybody calls you, either take their number and call me or have them call me. And that I got three calls right in a row within about 15 minutes of people saying there was an individual red light 
hovering above the Grand River, which goes through Lansing. And I thought, well, that's pretty odd. I walked out into my backyard thinking uh, I might get lucky, too, or I'll figure out that this is something way ordinary that people are grossly misidentifying. And as dusk was falling and stars were just starting to pop out, two of these quote-unquote stars simultaneously began moving, one further away from me, one approaching me. And as it got quite close to my little town, I realized this is not one light, it's really four. They're in a small square pattern, uh, and on opposite corners were two red lights and two green lights, and they were flashing. And again, FAA rules came to mind for me, as every plane has to have one green light, no plane can have two. So as it moved on by my town, following a, a, a state highway, I just opened the door and shouted in to my wife, uh, who was threatened by my involvement in this and very bored with the subject herself. She had seen this happen and then went back in to do the dishes. Um, I just shouted in, I've got to drive. I needed to follow this, whatever it was and wherever it was going. So I, by the time I got out onto the highway, it was maybe a half mile ahead of me. And in a 10 or 12 foot square, I kept straining, and I had good eyesight at the time, trying to see what the body uh, was that was attached to these lights. And I concluded there is no body. This is strictly four lights flying in that square formation. Well, they got close to a, a little village west of my town. And as it approached that village, it suddenly shot at an angle and went directly over that town. It was a little setback from the road. And as it went over its little one-block business district, the whole sky lit up for just an instant as it reminded me of taking a flash picture of this town. And I thought, well, that's odd. This is a nothing a little village. Well, the lights kept going on a northwest path, and I knew the road kept going west. So I took gravel road to the west, finding a gravel road to the north and to the west and to the north. I lost track of these lights. They're beating me on the crow's path, as it were. Um, the gravel roads were very rolling. There were trees up close. I had completely lost sight of them when I came into a clearing, and there they were just hovering some 60 yards away over this field, just, oh, 12, 15 feet above the ground, but still this monotonous red, green, red flashing. Well, I pulled off onto a driveway and aimed my car headlights at this and did something I had no knowledge of, sort of like a Morse code with my headlights, uh, and I did that for, say, five minutes, and it did not cause these lights to do anything different. So I finally said to myself, well, how could you ever ask someone else if you wouldn't do it yourself? Get out of your car and walk right up to them. If this is it, it's been an interesting life. So I opened the <laughs> I've door. I've been to my there and done tank. that. Go ahead. <laughs> I stood up between the door and the body of the car and just like that, my mind went blank. I don't know how long I stood there. I don't know, Whitley, if I was there for one more minute or a half an hour or an hour. I didn't have a watch on. Uh, but when I sort of came back to full consciousness, the lights weren't in front of me anymore. And I thought, what the hey? And I swiveled around, and there they were in an adjacent field behind me. So the thought of walking over to them never occurred to me again. All I could think to do was get in my car, maneuver it with several swipes on this driveway, and point my car in the new direction and start flashing my headlights again. 
a few more minutes of that and getting no different reaction. And again, a queasy feeling came over me. No, you're not supposed to be involved here. You're interrupting something. You must leave. I started my car and I drove away. Now, I, you got to know more than one MUFON member has said to me over the years, you confronted a UFO and you drove away? <laughs> yeah, they haven't yes, been I, there. <laughs> they don't know. I got home. I don't know how late it was. My wife had gone to bed, and I just sat down in a lazy boy chair and started rocking, thinking, these guys don't need any weapons. They just bend your mind a little bit, and you do exactly what they want. So that, together with the first encounter three weeks before, really cemented it for me. I just had to stay in this for a lifetime. Well, of course. I've, I have ne never heard a better reason for becoming involved in this than that. That is one of the most spectacular groups of stories, not only your father, but you. Free Dreamlanders will be right back. Ever wonder what the Close Encounter experience is all about? Think you know what it's about? When you open Whitley and Ann Streber's Immortal Communion Letters, you're going to experience a whole new vision. Not something being told to us by researchers and theorists, but the actual testimony of people who came face to face with this unknown. Unforgettable. And the book is only $3.99 at Streber.com. This is Whitley Streber. I'll be at the Portal to Ascension Conference October 4th to the 6th, 2019. Go to ascensionconference.com to find out more. It's going to be a really good show. Michael Tellinger will be there. J.J. and Desiree Hertog, Travis Walton, and of course, yours truly. I'll be talking about A New World, the new book that I am bringing out, as well as ongoing contacts with Anne, who is still very much part of this whole operation. Incredibly. What a life. Don't miss me at the Portal to Ascension Conference. It's going to be a lot of fun. Earthfiles.com is Linda Moulton Howe's great website, offering news of the edge of science and reality. Keep up with Linda's work every single day on earthfiles.com. Whitley Strieber became the host of Dreamland in 1998, and he's still the host today. One of the first podcasts, Dreamland has been built into the premier program of its kind, exploring the edge of science and reality. The show's archive on unknowncountry.com dates back to 2004. Dreamland is a treasure unique in the world. Help keep us on the air by subscribing to unknowncountry.com today. Go to unknowncountry.com and click on the subscribe tab. Dreamland, where wonder is spoken. Free Dreamlanders, I certainly hope you respond to some of those commercials, especially subscribe to the site because a lot of you just sit and listen and don't do that and that will cause this to change, and I don't want it to change. We're talking to Dan Wright, his new book, The CIA UFO Papers, 50 Years of Government Secrets and Cover-Up. And as you heard, this is a man who comes to this from a very extraordinary and amazing place. Now, Dan, let's let me ask you a little bit more after this, you sat in the Lazy Boy. You <laughs> went to bed, presumably. Did you ever yeah, get any okay. sense okay. of how much time had passed? Because I think you might have been in that thing. Um, you know, people have kind of suggested that from time to time. And I cannot tell you, again, whether that loss of consciousness was a minute or an hour and a half. Um, it was late when I got home. Not the middle of the night, but... Um, I didn't even think to look at a clock. I was No, in those days we didn't think about that. We didn't know anything about missing time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um it's been suggested to me before that yes, I left my car, walked into that field and had a full-blown abduction scenario. But that doesn't quite ring true to me. Because when I did come back to full consciousness, I'm in exactly the same spot between the car body and door. So I've always satisfied myself by saying, well, they just 
among themselves said, the poor guy has tried so hard, let's give him a thrill. Yeah, um, maybe so. so. So I think I just stood there drooling on my shoes for some minutes. Uh, I really don't think I've ever been abducted, and I am having you know done several years of work covering nothing but that. I know what yeah, the... Yeah, uh, you sure have. Yeah, I know what the markers are, and I don't have any. I've never had any dream or um, revelation or anything like that about it. Well, so... But it was surely damn impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you probably would have something by now. Stuff come, it, yeah. it, as you know, creeps back. But, you know, I would like to, just before we go on into the CIA UFO papers, which, folks, by the way, is marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Uh, and of course, I, I always say that about books when I have books on Dreamland, because I wouldn't read them if they weren't. I mean, I can't get through a book. <laughs> if I can't get through it, I can't talk about it either. It's as simple as that. And that is not the case here in spades. It was riveting. Anyway, tell us a little bit about the abduction transcription project. Uh, and because you worked on that for quite a while. Yes. Although the back cover of the book did get it wrong. It wasn't 11 years. It was five years. I did some other things. Oh, well, in that case, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not <But> really. I, <laughs> I, um, I put together a group of psychologists and hypnotherapists who were doing regressive hypnosis on persons who suspected, at least, that they had been abducted. Um, in the course of five years, I went through over 250 such separate cases. Some were whole families, some were a husband and wife. Many of them were just an individual. Um, and the byword on all of this that I realized, I came to realize, is if you, it, the chances are greatly against your ever having an abduction. You know, you're one of some fraction of 1%. But if you do have one, you're likely to have several or many in your lifetime. They keep coming back to the same people at various points in their life. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking right now of a remark that if a fellow said w way back then, the only thing I know for sure is that they'll be back. So yeah. <laughs> I, along with this group of 20 psychologists and hypnotherapists who had been um, using regressive hypnosis and taping the sessions, I put together also a cadre of people to transcribe the tapes. Uh, and I went through quite a few of those, frankly, because this was very tiresome work mentally. It, it really got to a lot of people listening to these moans and crying out and you know, where, where people were really reliving the experience. Um, but I, I will always be grateful to those people who hung in there and got the typing done on the cases they they did work on. And from that, I um, it ended up with two appearances at MUFON Symposia in 95 and 97, and um, a not a book, but a long report out of it. Um, of the 250 plus, to be conservative, and I've always tried to follow that line, I would say a good 100 of them were absolutely credible. There were also some people who just wanted to be part of a special quote unquote club of abductees. Others were simply delusional. Uh, but a solid 100, especially those where it was uh, a wife watches her husband being lifted off the bed and taken through the wall. Yeah. And on. Those kinds of cases were just jaw dropping. There are many multiple witness cases. We found that out reading the communion letters. People, you know, multiple yeah. witness cases are, are not a hundred, it's not a hundred percent by any means, but it's not at all uncommon. Not at all. We had yeah, many cases and in some like cases that. It involved the whole family. 
I one case involved three generations. Uh, I think again, that the all I know for sure is that they'll be back. Yeah. Well, you know, in my particular case, I'm one of these. I don't know if I don't know if this is common knowledge, but a lot of military families that get get involved when the someone in the family has something to do with this in one way or another. And my uncle and my father, my uncle was involved in the Roswell incident at Wright Pat. He was one of the people who examined the debris and the biological materials. Hmm. And uh, my father was somehow involved in this. I, I'm not sure how, um, because he was very, very close mouth, as indeed was my uncle. I never knew. The only thing, ironically, I know about what my uncle did in his entire career was this, of all things, because he sat me down one day and told me uh, – this was after communion had been published and told me his story and then introduced me to general arthur exon who i then introduced to stanton friedman and um uh his a brief interview with him ended up in kevin randall's and don schmidt's book about roswell uh-huh. so uh and he told me a lot more and i based uh, on a, a, a lot of what he said and what my uncle said uh, i based my book majestic on it not all of it but some anyway let's Go on, and that's sort of just uh, secondary. Yeah, I'd here. like to make one further observation before we leave the abduction um, subject, and that is, to me, um, always, you know, I guess I've been an insider more than an outsider, but to me, the 60, 70 now year plus history of this subject is one of chapters. The Aliens, if you will, collectively do one thing for a while. In the 60s, that there were a lot of cases of saucers landing in a farm field, little guys jumping out, grabbing some soybeans or whatever the plants were, and running back inside, and away it would go. They were only five-minute or less um, episodes, but repeated thousands of times. You get into the 70s, you don't hear about that anymore. And as along the same line, in the 80s and 90s, uh, we were inundated by new cases of abduction. I think abductions are still going on today, but only those who were selected back then. There's no new cases anymore. No, there People aren't any. People haven't lost interest. There simply isn't anything new happening. They finished the project. They finished that project and moved it, it, on. But, but there are now, is now a group of people, many of whom um, spend time on unknown country, who are in kind of an ongoing contact situation that is yeah. gradually getting more and more intimate, frankly. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, it's difficult. In other cases, it's not. Yeah, but, not surprising. Yeah, exactly. It depends on a person's reaction, uh, you know, how they how they view this. And I, I know some people who I, – I know one case in which someone apparently committed suicide over this. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's very sad. And I know other cases where people are heavily, deeply involved with – what I call the visitors for, I mean, which is a very broad spectrum word, by the way, True. and are having, like I am, having very fascinating lives with this. So it's quite a mixed bag. Now, we're going to take a little break for our free Dreamlanders. And after that, I want to briefly return to that tr- triangle craft. And then we're going to go way deeper into what the CIA did and is doing in connection with this. We're talking to Dan Wright about the CIA UFO papers, his dynamite new book. We'll be right back. You think that what subscribers to unknowncountry.com get is just an archive or a rehash of what you can hear for free? Not quite true. Listen to this. Uh, the Indonesian doctor is writing an article in the 1980s. This is more than 10 years 
after the mysterious German doctor has died. And now he's writing his recollections of that whole episode. And one of his recollections was that there was a small boy at one time when he first met the doctor in the island of Sumbawa. There was a small American boy living with him. And that small American boy may very well have been the son of the mysterious doctor that Peter Lavenda is talking about. A special interview called Adolf Hitler in Asia. That boy went on to grow up, to come to the United States, to become a horrendous anti-Semite and serial killer. He was executed in Indiana in 2010. I'm telling you, you don't hear this anywhere else. Nowhere else. So come on, get on the stick. Become a subscriber to UnknownCountry.com. I guarantee you there is incredible information in our subscriber area, and we need you to keep supporting this. It's important. There's no place like it. No other website offers you the amazing riches of unusual and extraordinary information that we do. Subscribe today. Ever wonder which Whitley Strieber books are available and where you can get them? Now you can go to Whitley Strieber's dedicated book website, strieber.com, and shop for every Whitley Strieber item that's available. Many of them are available in electronic form, as well as hardcover and paperback. Experience the magic of transformation, the insights of breakthrough, the joy of miraculous journey. Join Whitley on the wondrous journey of that is his life. Thrill to his fiction, the magic of Orenda, the startling power of Alien Hunter, and so much more. Go to Strieber.com now and explore. We're back talking to Dan Wright, the CIA UFO papers. We're just sort of getting closer to the papers themselves and to what was found, because don't buy in for a minute to the idea that the CIA revealed nothing of importance. It told a story in this, in, in, in these papers, and Dan has distilled them and has revealed that story. But before that, I want to get back to the triangle. And something very interesting that has happened in the in the sort of meme world, which is this idea of the TR3B, as it's called, uh, the supposed uh, triangular uh, space plane that the Air Force has. And people are always saying, oh, well, he saw a TR3B. But the problem is this. Two problems. First of all, it, it, a lot of these sightings, your sightings, are from way before anything like that was I even possibly in the Air Force's inventory. But more importantly, the first place I can find a description of the TR-3B is in my novel, Majestic. I made it up. I made up the functionality of it. I made up the name. I made up all of it. And now it's become sort of something people believe is a real thing and it's really yeah. odd and i'm i'm left to think that what if it is real and lockheed martin sort of jokingly uh used my designation for the thing uh, i just don't know what to make of it but in any case i'm just saying folks that he probably didn't see a military aircraft that's what i'm trying to say yeah that's a, a couple of thoughts on triangles, boomerangs, or something in between, which they actually are. And this was no small plane. It was Its wingspan was greater than a B-52. This was not a small aircraft. Um, but what I have told one skeptic or another, uh, those sitting on the fence about this subject, is if that was, say, a prototype, in 1978, when I saw it, 40 years later, wouldn't we want a whole fleet of these things that can travel at jogging speed, can hover silently, can do 360s in the space of a 10-foot circle? Yeah, of course we would. But as each year passes and the military has nothing like this, 
is all the more convincing to me that it never was a military project. Now, also, I would skip forward from 78. I just happened to see this thing a little bit earlier. In 81 and again in 82 and 83, the Hudson Valley area of southern New York was beset by these things. They were or an individual triangle, one at a time, was going across parkways and freeways at, again, jogging speed, stopping, uh, casting beams of light onto cars. Hundreds at a time were seeing this thing. Um, after being there in 82, I believe in March, I forget the date of 82, one year and one day later, it was back in the same spot. I don't know why they let one more day go <laughs> from a year, but yeah, maybe that the calendar was, was off. in total by thousands of motorists outside their cars, shaking their heads in full agreement, what the heck is this thing? Um, yeah. And pivoting. Um, after hovering, going at great speed into the distance. No, these were not military aircraft. What the heck were they? I don't know. All I can tell you is that I saw one. Well, you know, in addition, they, they often have red, green, and white lights at the corners of the triangle. Mm -hmm. And in the fairy lore, that is, the, the, those are the traditional colors used by trooping fairies. Green jacket, red cap, white owl's feather. So maybe they've modernized. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay. Now, let's get on to the CIA UFO papers. Mm -hmm. These papers are released. I saw them. You saw them. I looked at this melange of stuff, and I thought, oh, God, I wonder if there's anything in here. How, <laughs> how did you react? <laughs> well, I heard about it in um, very early January um, of 17. One thing that has not been mentioned or mentioned much is because of what I found, the manner of it as I discovered it, I think the CIA was caught with its pants down. It was told by Obama as a parting shot just before the end of his second term. You take this stuff that's always been in the National Archives. They were all declassified documents, but you had to go physically to the National Archives and use one of their four desktop computers so you could you know, stand around all day waiting for one to come free. That was no way to learn about this. And so Obama said, put this on your website and be done with it, which they did. And on January 17, officially of, of 2017, um, they were downloaded. And the CIA then makes a trumpeting call to America that we have placed a million pages of UFO papers onto our website. Well, I, I phoned Jan Harzen, the uh, new director of MUFON, executive director, and said, presuming that you're forming a group to uh, inspect these papers, I mean, it's a lot, um, I, I joined the effort. Well, Jan said, uh, no, actually, I haven't, but you're feel free to put together a group yourself. <laughs> so I thought, well, before I start calling up people to see if I can interest them in it, I'd better have a look myself to see what we're talking about here. What I discovered over the course of days and weeks gave me pause about bringing anyone else into it because it was very frustrating. There were not, for starters, a million pages of anything. It was a little over 100,000 pages, and literally 98% of those had nothing whatsoever to do with UFOs. 
if you wanted to know all about Bulgarian train tonnage in 1956, well, it was there. Um, all manner of subjects under the sun were in these papers, but the great, great share of it was throwaway. And what I ended up with after five months of doing nothing but sorting was 550 usable files or just documents that pertained at least in part to the UFO subject. Many, many of these would be from, you can call them op operatives, you can call them assets, I call them spies from other countries spread throughout uh, Europe, uh, even in the then Soviet Union and in Northern Africa, and among other um, classified news that they were sending along to Washington, they would repeat an account that they'd been told locally about UFO. And so many, many of the documents that I looked at had great areas of that blacked out, and then maybe out of one out of 13 subjects making up the report would be on UFOs. And that's why I didn't want to trouble anyone else to have to make these editorial decisions and the frustration of throwing so much away. But I did end up with 550 useful documents, and they do tell quite a story about the history of the CIA. From that, I would segue back into World War II. Um, before there was a CIA, FDR, being fascinated by what British and French spies were coming up with um, about the Nazis, they, he wanted an agency like that that could dig into the Nazi um, Italian and Japanese war machines while at the same time obscuring what the American capacities were. So he created an office called the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, and he put at its, at its head a former World War I commanding general um, named Wild Bill Donovan. <laughs> I guess they, at the time, they liked nicknames because Black Jack Pershing led the whole American forces during World War I. Uh, but Wild Bill Donovan became the head of OSS, and he had been something of a war hero in World War I. He'd been mostly in a civilian capacity after that. He became a lawyer. But OSS, for the course of three years, did what it was supposed to do, obscure for the other European publics what capacities we had while stealing and catching as one can information about their secrets, their military capacities. Just coincidental to that, beginning in 43, OSS agents began hearing the occasional story, and it became more than occasional, about what they came to call, or the fighter pilots came to call, Foo Fighters. These would be just globes of light or plasma, uh, basketball size, beach ball size, not huge, that would suddenly appear along one of their wingtips or nearby and travel along with them. Now, Skeptics would say, ah, oh, that's just ball lightning. There is such a thing as ball lightning, but it is a terribly rare phenomenon, and it's only momentary. And it needs um, thunderstorm conditions to appear. It is a form of lightning, after all. Whereas these just meandered along with planes for long miles, much longer than ball lightning would ever hang out with, but whether they were fighter pilots or bomber pilots that had these going, and they did come to know that German and Italian fighters were having the same experience, but it 
they weren't considered threatening per se. The worst that would happen would be that a fighter pilot's engine would sputter and run kind of roughly. But they they weren't regarded as an enemy. They were just fodder for the drinks at the bar in between combat missions. And that carried on through the end of the war in 45, the Foo Fighter chapter in this whole episode, I guess. Now, the OSS was disbanded in in 45, then uh, regathered and continued in a in a lesser form through uh the Korean War but in 47 uh Truman passed through Congress the National Security Act which established both the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Council and so most of the book picks up with that 47 which curiously in in time frame, that act was passed within two weeks of two major events, the Kenneth Arnold sighting in the um, mountains of the state of Washington, followed by the Roswell crash. Um, and then with Roswell, the airwaves and newspapers just exploded with stories of saucers. And the CIA did not know what the heck to do with all of this. No, it would be probably pretty <laughs> a, a nonplussed. You know, I want to go back, though, to something that you refer to very briefly in the section called Nazi UFOs. And Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that. And I, I was fascinated. I've always been fascinated by this question because – I've had the sense that something about all of this was was real, but I don't know what it was. Well, for example, when I was a boy, uh, I had, uh, you know, and not just Guy Hicks lived behind me uh, on the next street over. Uh, the, he's the, the, the commanding officer in the Mantell incident. Uh, but also a number of other people who had thick German accents lived on that same street, Tuttle Road, mm. and um, I, I and they worked at Randolph Air Force Base under a, a man named Hubertus Strughold in the high altitude uh, medicine lab. There, Strughold was also a Nazi scientist who was eventually discredited and. Uh, various awards and so forth were withdrawn when it was found out what he had actually done at Auschwitz and so forth. In any case, tell us a little bit about Project Lothar, what what you found out about it. Uh, it's amorphous and yet telling. There were rumors that as early as 1941, some German scientists and engineers began work on a flying saucer, um, and that by 44, they had constructed three different models, uh, one of which was definitely saucer-shaped. Uh, the claims were that they could travel up to 1,200, 1,300 miles an hour, make tight turns, something way, way beyond the best of our conventional aircraft. But with the end of the war, those stories drifted away. To my knowledge, no saucer or anything else of a of an experimental design was ever captured and brought back to the States or whatever. So uh, in terms of the CIA's involvement and what they allowed to be released here in 2017, that story sort of died. There were these claims about German scientists and engineers neck deep in this business. Oh, there was one more aspect, and that was that the Nazis were doing much of this at a um, an underground base that slaves 
had uh, dug out to make tunnels and underground caverns, that that's where this experimentation was going on, that one of the types was called the bell because it was basically the shape of a bell. Um, But whatever happened to them, I don't know. There was one claim that the uh, Roswell incident was actually a testing of one of these bell-shaped objects. I, frankly, I don't buy that, but that was a claim. And after the war, that that just drifted away. Whatever became of the scientists, let alone their creations, I don't know. Well, as far as Roswell is concerned, General Exxon saw the bodies. He held the body. He ca- carried them, and they weren't human bodies. So to me, yeah, that... Right. that uh, kind of puts to rest this whole business of it being Russian children in disguise or whatever. monkeys, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, so that that kind of sits there. And, you know, I just just wonder if something kind of came over here and went deep underground. And you just don't know what the heck is going on. But – the um the let's let's talk now about the Battelle or no rather than the Battelle Memorial, Memorial Institute we're going to do that in the third half hour. Uh, let's go to the fifties and talk about the the we're going to folks we're going to go through the different sort of things that happened because as we was pointed out earlier as Dan pointed out earlier at different times different types of event were more commonplace. I mean, you can probably find abduction accounts from the 60s and even the 50s, for all I know, but you you won't find many. But once you get into the late 70s and 80s and 90s, they peak. Now, you won't find many anymore either. Not people who have recently been abducted for the first time. I get some on the website, sure, but mostly it's 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 in the past now, or it's people who are being revisited in a new way. But let's go back to the fifties and what was happening. Tell tell us if you will about you know we get these events in forty seven, forty eight, uh, Roswell, the Mantell incident, a few other events. Now the fifties come along. What? Yeah, between forty eight and fifty two, it was frankly very quiet. Forty nine, fifty, fifty one virtually nothing is being reported to police or anyone else. But then came 1952, and why there should be a renewal, I don't know. Um, But with using uh, something called the IFDRB, uh, an information document that came to be commonplace, sort of like memo head, um, Beginning in March of 52, an IFDRB was titled Flying Saucers Over Belgian Congo Uranium Mines. Uh, Two discs buzzing and zigzagging around those. Then the rest, I won't read the details of all of these, but on April 27, at both Roseville, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit, and Yuma, Arizona, there are close encounters involving multiple adults on the same day. On May 1, there was an incident at George Air Force Base in California where four staff were looking at something close at hand. And in that same week, at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, a, a captain and two sergeants and an airman see a cylinder darting about above the base for five minutes and more. Then on May 21, a rocket-shaped object passed over Barcelona, Spain. On May 29, back in San Antonio, an Air Force pilot and ground crew saw another cylinder. On June 1, there was a particularly cool uh, episode in my mind. A cargo ship and its shipmaster and first mate were at anchor 
on a, a little Western African country called Gabon, G-A-B-O-N. And they saw a luminous object rise up from beyond the port and do multiple right-angle turns until it moved out of sight. Early in July, an East German father and his daughter are riding on the father's motorcycle when it blew a tire. As the father is starting to fix the tire, the daughter brought to his attention something that was happening in a nearby woods, some something or someone moving around. Well, they were both curious enough to leave the repair of the motorcycle and walk over there. They got within 10 yards of a landed saucer and two beings outside it with metallic clothing and lamps attached to their waist that that flashed from time to time for whatever reason. They were staring at it from this, you know, 30 feet away, still hiding behind trees, when the daughter spoke to her father, and that alerted these guys who raced back into the ship and with fire and and um, smoke and whatever, it lifted off, off the ground and was gone, and they found a depressed circle uh, where it had been. So that was just kind of a favorite for me. It, it rung as very true. Uh, that all leads, well, in Algeria, there was an event on July 15, two on July 26, two more on July 30, and two more on July 31, all involving different people in different locales of Algeria. Um, the Netherlands had something involving a V formation of disks flying overhead. But that all leads up to something many of your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with. The night of July 19 and 20, and again July 26, radars at Washington National Airport and nearby Andrews Air Force Base um, were picking up something that they that shouldn't be there. Airliners coming in to land at Washington National also had their radars light up with something in the distance. No objects as such were seen, but from the blips on the radar, they were of tremendous size and moving radically up, down, sideways. So eventually, Andrews sent for some help. But curiously, or with by bad luck, Andrews Air Force Base itself was, at that point, inoperable. All of its runways were being repaved. So they had set off their jet interceptors to a base in Delaware. And they phoned over at, at some point in mid-evening. They phoned to the base in Delaware to bring them on. And then that's when, as a fighting force, the Air Force dropped the ball. Jet fighters do not arrive in Washington until 3 in the morning. And when they get within radar distance, these anomalies, these unknowns that are still in the area, boogied and left the radar screen. Of course, the jet pilots see nothing. They head back, and as soon as they left the um, radar scope, the unknowns came back. They sent for the fighters <laughs> again. That, that's, they, swamp they gas does back. that. It's very they surprising. They come back and find nothing because the unknowns have gone up, down, or sideways. <laughs> and as yeah. soon as the fighters leave, the unknowns came back. Why they were there, I have no idea. Whether they were scouting the shape of a Congress or what, but that made major headline. So that's what I know about 1952. It kind of peaked with that. But that went down as a very signature year that wasn't duplicated until really 1966 and beyond. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it was a, you know, Frank Fischino, 
Do you know Frank? Or no, I don't. Well, he was a. I, don't, I haven't been in touch with him for years, but uh, f- if you input his name, uh, subscribers into the search engine on Unknown Country, you'll find an interview or two with him. Uh, he wrote a couple of books about uh, Air Force and Air Force's re- relationship, if you could call it that, with the UFO phenomenon. And he pointed out that at the same time that that was happening in Washington, there were all kinds of bizarre events taking place all the way down through uh, West Virginia it, it, in the same exact time period. And he thought it was all related. And I thought, I think it might have been some kind of an attempt to establish communication with us, perhaps. I or, mm-hmm. I don't know. But whatever it it was, it ended and it, it didn't go any farther. Now, in the second half of the show, we're going to talk more about uh, some fascinating stuff, the ham radio flap, and I want to bring up the Battelle Memorial Institute, which has a, to this day, plays a role in this, uh, in my opinion. But before... I, I do need to go back to 1952 in terms of the CIA's and Oh, okay, let's do that now. Okay. Um, by the autumn of 52, having heard a lot of accounts, and especially the Washington, D.C. stuff in July, the CIA director really wanted some answers, and he put the honest on a major office within the CIA called the Office of Scientific Intelligence, or I'll just refer to it as OSI, who the notorious on, OSI, yes. two decades, had responsibility for this area of human thought. And he wanted some immediate attention on this, the CIA director did. Well, among themselves at OSI, which was not a small office, this was um, an office probably of hundreds that had four different scientific divisions within it. But they concluded after getting together a few times that the public was never going to be satisfied with any government answers about flying saucers until they brought hard science to bear. So they uh, established a contact with a fellow named H.U. Robertson, a physicist, and he in turn put together a small group, just I think four more people of physicists plus a certain person whose name has probably come up before on this show, J. Allen Hynek. Yeah, it's come up a bit. (laughs) Who two decades later would found the Center for UFO Studies. But in 1952, he was a hardcore skeptic. And he attended a series of meetings over four days in January of 53, where the, um, the group went through a smattering few um, cases where there was physical evidence, like um, a um, movie taken by a career Navy photographer using a um, state-of-the-art for its time movie camera, taking uh, long minutes of something high in the sky, which he said was 10, probably saucer but unknown shapes. And they looked at that and decided, he's either looking at a group of mylar balloons or a group of seagull. Now, why there would be as many as 10 balloons flying together would strain credulity. Uh, The seagulls, well, okay. Um, Then they looked at, that was in Tremonton, Utah. And there was also another case in Idaho with some film footage that was of a um, baseball, minor league baseball manager tending the field. You know, managers had that kind of duties in the minors back then. And he saw something going overhead and he grabbed a, a movie camera and took some film footage of it. He was maybe. Um, 
naive enough to think that if he turned it over to the Air Force, he'd get it back. <laughs> uh, he did eventually get it back, but with a great number of the frames missing, the frames that showed these objects in the clearest form. And using, I guess, the film without that missing footage, this group in 53 decided that, no, he was looking at two F-94 jets reflecting the sun. So that was the, the attitude and the uh, scheduling of four days and 12 hours from which the, the, uh, the group finally said that um, the aura of mystery that this subject has unfortunately acquired needed to be uh, dispelled and that what should happen would be a retraining of the public that all they were looking at were IFOs, identifiable, not unidentifiable flying objects, um, and known things like weather um, weather balloons and Venus and Mars mistakes. Right. They needed and, to train or re-educate the public that what they were looking at was IFOs, and for anything that seemed to be beyond that, the Air Force should debunk the, the cases in order to take the, the public's interest away from them. In other that, words, they couldn't yeah, do anything about them, so a let's major just... major event in the 60s when that memo from the CIA directing the Air Force to debunk future cases came to light. Okay, we have reached the end of our first hour, Free Dreamlanders. I would like to thank you for being with us during this period, and I uh, hope you subscribe to unknowncountry.com. It's not expensive. It's one of the least expensive ones on the internet. It's four ninety five a month. And you can get it for less if you subscribe for three months or more at a time, which you should do. And it is a place of exploration. You can explore deeply into these mysteries at Unknown Country. It is probably the largest news site of its kind in the world. Also, Dreamland, going back to 2004, William Henry's fascinating revelations, the experience with Jeremy Vaney, Ann Streber's full run of her Out There show, which was endlessly fascinating, and so much more. It's, a, it's actually an unbelievable treasure trove, this website. It's something extremely special. It will eventually be archived at Rice University, along with the communion letters and all of the other Whitley Streber material. But right now, it's here. It's living. And I am also living. And so help us get over there and get a subscription. Thank you very much for being with us today. I'd like to thank Dan Wright for spending time with us. His book, The CIA UFO Papers, absolute dynamite, a brilliantly put together book, 50 Years of Government Secrets and Cover-Up. When we get back, subscribers, we're going to start by talking about a, a disappearing super constellation back in 1954, a horrifying story I knew nothing whatsoever about. We're going to ask Dan about what he found about this bizarre and tragic event.